declared to be null and void, then where, can, where do we stand? We go you back see? to the 1920s, 30s, and mm -hmm. 40s. And we have to also keep in mind that with a Supreme Court that is viewed now as predominantly conservative mm -hmm. and Republican, uh, we have to think in terms of what this means for the separation of powers mm -hmm. because, and, and also the checks and balances. The balances uh, it, right. Because if it's a Republican court, and it's a Republican Congress it, and, a and a Republican, Republican president, president, then you, whatever, have, yeah. you have no separation That's of powers right. and uh -huh. you have no checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And I think that issue comes into focus mm -hmm. as well. Well, now, I think that uh, one of the important things I think that we face even today, Dr. Baldwin, is the participation of African. The only way that we can keep things from changing is to be a part of the system. And, and, as long as the, and as long as we keep ourselves out of the, the system, system. Uh, without voting, yeah. see, that's, that's what gets us in the system. I think you're, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right, absolutely right, that midterm elections 2018 mm -hmm. are very important mm -hmm. because we have to be involved, we have to vote, we make, have to make sure that we are represented, mm -hmm. not only at the congressional level, mm -hmm. But in the future, we have to be concerned about the executive mm -hmm. branch. We know where we're we going in terms of the kind of president mm -hmm. of the United mm -hmm. States we want. Uh, now, the Supreme Court has pretty much been, uh, been finalized mm -hmm. for the time being and for perhaps generations to come. Mm -hmm. But we still have the right of the ballot. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and, and we have to use that as our tool for that is the effecting most change. Uh -huh. That is the most important thing that we do have. Exactly. And, and disfranchisement. You know, exactly. about all of the issues surrounding disfranchisement and keeping black folks from the poll. Exactly. That's all do, dealing with progress. To re, people would like to remove Brown versus the Board of Education and all yeah. these other uh, Supreme decisions. Court deci Supreme yeah. Court decisions. Yeah. Not everybody, yeah. but there are a large number of folks who would like to do so. And so we're going to take our break and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Lewis Baldwin and the topic is the African Americans and the uh, United States Supreme Court. Dr. Baldwin, let's continue our discussion in reference to the African American and the court and some of the things that you believe to be important in terms of uh, uh, where we go from here. Yes, yes. I think one of the things, of course, we have to be concerned about is that we are moved completely from race, considerations mm -hmm. based on race, to uh, a system of merit-based mm -hmm. admissions in colleges and universities, mm -hmm. for example, when you talk about affirmative action. Unfortunately, we don't have a third good marshal on the Supreme Thank Court you. anymore. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We don't have a third good mm -hmm. marshal. We have mm -hmm. a uh, um, Clarence Thomas, we have John Roberts, mm -hmm. we have uh, several other uh, people on the, mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court who uh, tend to lean toward the extreme right. Mm -hmm. And of course, we only have Alana Kagan and uh, Sonia Sotomayor oh, yeah. oh, and, uh, uh -huh. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg on, 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 on the more liberal side mm -hmm. who dis tend to decide in favor of what? Mm -hmm. uh, decisions that benefit people mm -hmm. of color mm -hmm. and women. Mm -hmm. So what we have to be concerned about is where, uh, w what will happen to affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Now, in the past, uh, the Supreme Court has deferred to corporations and universities, mm -hmm. other institutions to make their own decisions about how they plan to pursue diversity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that will happen mm -hmm. in the future with the recent confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court, and as you well know, there was a lot of conflict, there was a lot of tension surrounding mm -hmm. his nomination yes, and yes, confirmation, and confirmation yes. to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, the fear we have now is that affirmative action will uh, eventually be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and nothing worse could happen to African Americans, then to people of color, and even women. Women, that's because right. women have benefited uh -huh. from affirmative uh -huh. action, mm -hmm. and that's often overlooked. Mm -hmm. The extent to which white women, black women, women in general, general very have good. benefited uh -huh. from affirmative action. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where will the Supreme Court go from here? Mm -hmm. What impact can we have? on the kind of decision making that comes out of the court. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that uh, <laughs> that it's a predominantly what? Mm -hmm. Republican court. Now, it we is. have to call it, it what has it is. Been. That's right, it we is have now. To, we yeah, have to call it what it is. Uh -huh. The only question we have now is how can we assure mm -hmm. that the future of this nation uh, is developed around this need mm -hmm to really include, include people, okay, very good. to be inclusive, mm -hmm. to make sure that all people enjoy the fullness of equality mm -hmm. and their rights. Mm -hmm. Women, African Americans, Latinos, Asian, Asian Americans, mm -hmm. I think that's very important mm -hmm. as we look to the future in terms of what happens between uh, not only African Americans mm -hmm. in the Supreme Court, but minorities in general. Well, everything since, since the Brown decision. Yeah. Uh, dealing with uh, race yeah. is at stake yeah. in a real sense and what we have to do. And the only way I see us getting around this situation, Dr. Baldwin, is through the suffrage. Yeah. That's about the only way. I mean, I don't uh, see any kind of uh, laws that might be or uh, any kind of decisions that this court yeah. would be willing to issue yeah. that would to bring back affirmative action that would uh, do something in terms of uh, elevating the African American. I, exactly. don't, I don't see that in this court. And it's so a court that is designed to turn back the clock. Mm -hmm. and, and as we look to the future, we need to press forward. Mm -hmm. uh, as Dr. King and, and other civil rights leaders always said, that the goal is always to press forward mm -hmm. and to design ways in which one can move the nation mm -hmm. forward in terms of respect for diversity, mm -hmm. in terms of inclusiveness, and, and we can't do that any other way than through the ballot. That's the only way. I mean, that's yeah. the most important thing that we have going for us. It, it has always been, but quite recently, there seems to be a tendency on the part of some of us to yeah. simply not vote and to simply not give vote. up and voting. That's unfortunate, see? but mm -hmm. we are hoping that the 2018 midterms Terms, uh -huh. will be different. Uh -huh. That people have gotten to the point where they realize that we're moving back mm -hmm. instead of forward mm -hmm. and they will come out and vote. 
uh, because the makeup the, of the Supreme Court is just as important mm. as the makeup of the Senate mm -hmm. and the House of Representatives oh, yeah. and the executive branch. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't pay attention to the mm. Supreme Court. But mm -hmm. those on the right did, and that's why Brett Kavanaugh was uh -huh. confirmed. That's right. That's because they are uh -huh. expecting him to be a force in striking down, down. Uh -huh. affirmative action, mm -hmm. in striking down mm -hmm. uh, uh, the right of a woman to choose, mm -hmm. in undermining the reproductive rights of women, mm -hmm. uh, in supporting uh, those who are into gun advocacy. Mm -hmm. And, and those who are opposed to immigration, mm -hmm. which brings in more people of color. Uh -huh. So uh, the right, I think, understands the extreme right, the what's going on. That's right. But the important thing is that those of us who are not on the extreme right, mm -hmm. those of us who support uh, democratic policies, more mm -hmm. liberal policies, more inclusive policies, have to get involved through the ballot. Mm -hmm. And there's no other way. No I other mean, way. there's no other way that, uh, as a matter of fact, the, I think it's constructed. And deal, that's why the vote is important. And, and what we have to do is to make every person, not only Africans, because uh, black, white, or whatever, make every person understand how important the suffrage is. That's it, the most important thing in a democracy. That's right. That's what a democracy is all about, isn't it? That's right. You mm -hmm. lose democracy if mm -hmm. you don't vote. Mm -hmm. Your voice is not represented. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the gains that we've made as a result of the civil rights mm -hmm. movement, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mm -hmm. sacrifices, mm -hmm. the sacrifices of other people, mm -hmm. grassroots people, all of that is lost mm -hmm. if we don't go vote. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the important thing. And, and, and so that's why the Supreme Court is important. But now, see, it, it, it seems now that uh, the Supreme Court just might be out of our reach in terms of having any kind of influence because uh, what do we do? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how can you influence the court as long as the court is constituted as the court is constituted? Well, we are hopeful you? that providential design has something to do okay, with it. Okay. Because, it's a lot of you old know, folks. You can always put <laughs> people like Brett Kavanaugh and others on the court, uh -huh. but ultimately we, as coming out of the black church that's right. tradition and all, uh -huh. we know that uh, that there's a power but above. The, that's right, above the Supreme Court. That's that ultimately right. decides what's going to happen in the future. That's right. Uh -huh. And hopefully our reliance on that is what will save us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people on the extreme right can put everyone they desire in uh -huh. positions of power. Power, that's right. But, but ultimately, we have to understand that this universe is not controlled. By the people on the right. By the people on the right <laughs> or by the powers people, that be, be on this that's earth. That's right. That's exactly. But ultimately, there's a higher power mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. charge. And I, and I think, in a sense, that's the only, uh, the only um, thing that we have to rely on. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, because uh, those who have put Brett Kavanaugh and others in mm -hmm. place, Neil Gorsuch mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. they are assuming that for generations, generations. That, and that's they what will control the that's court. That's what they're saying. That's exactly what they're saying. But that what, is, you know, for the next 40 years, yes. nothing will change but, in reference to the court. But, but, yeah. but what is in the plan and uh, the promise of the higher power? That's right. That's right. And, we, and, and that's what, that's what and, is... And, and, as an older person, I can also say that we've got a lot of old folks on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And, and so what we have to do is to vote in such a way so that we can influence the individuals that be that will be appointed exactly. uh, to the court from now Elect on. Elect a new That's president right. uh -huh. on the Democratic side, hopefully. That's right. Uh, on the side that considers more the issues confronting that, minority that's, people and that's women. That's right. Doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a Democrat, mm -hmm. but we need someone who's sensitive to, to the issues, issues of justice that's right. that, and inclusiveness that's right. and equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. All of that is important. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that if we can keep our minds on that, you mm -hmm. see, starting with this election, uh, this in 2018, yeah. you know, the, the uh, midterm, uh, because I think we, you can send a signal. Dr. Yeah. Baldwin, we're going to have to end it for today. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of comments. Thank you and good morning.
Okay. Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> Everything comes to me. <laughs> you know. Ten. Down or up? <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Nine. Eight. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ten, nine, eight. Seven six five four three two one. Tangela Wilcox. Correct. <laughs> Bruce Ayers. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Pearl High School Entertainment. <laughs> Pearl. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to the show today. The topic this morning is Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet School Band. And of course, uh, we have with us to talk about Pearl Cone Entertainment uh, Magnet School Band, uh, the band director, uh, Coach Bruce Ayers, and uh, Ms. Tangela Wilcox. And of course, uh, Mr. Ayers and Ms. Wilcox, let me welcome you the two of you to the show this morning and to uh, tell you how delighted we are to uh, have you. Now, what we'll try to do today is to uh, talk about uh, Pearl Cone, the band, and all of that kind of information that you, the two of you would like to uh, give to us. But what we will do, first of all, is to have this first six minutes to talk about the two of you. And what we'd like to do during this time is to talk about your background, your education, and some of your experiences, and then we'll have a break and we'll come back with for another eight minute segment and then we'll have another break and then we'll come back for a 10 minute segment and so we want you to give us any information that you think is important dealing with the pearl cone high school magnet school band let's start off with you mr Ayers. all right well thank you for having us today um yes like you said my name is bruce Ayers. i am actually from dover delaware where i was born and raised um to a, a, a wonderful home had a loving mother a very strong father um, and they, they saw at a young age that music was where I was supposed to be. There was a battle there um, trying to get into the music field. Uh, they didn't always support it, but when they saw how much it meant to me, I think that's when the door started opening because they were there to support. Um, I graduated from Dover High School in 2008 where I was a drum major there. Um, and then after high school, I went to Virginia State University in Petersburg, Virginia, where I became also a drum major, uh, first sophomore drum major in the history of uh, Virginia State University, which is a HBCU. Um, and I think that's where a lot of my foundation started in the music field, uh, particularly in band. I fell in love with it. I knew then and there in college, that's what I was supposed to do for the rest of my life. And so I hope that I am a leading in a way that represents who I am and what music means to me for my students. Very good. Uh, Angela, let's, Tangela, let's uh, talk about your background, education, and some of the things that were important in your life, and then we'll have our first commercial break and then we'll come back. But let's talk about it from that perspective. Yes, sir. Um, as you stated, my name is Tangela Wilcox. I am born and raised from here, Nashville, Tennessee. 
Um, I started at a very, very young age uh, with majoring, baton twirling, um, all those types of, of things as far as dance. Um, I started, I was, I'm an alumni of White's Creek High School where I was a majorette there for four years. But I twirled for Tennessee Twirling Institute for mm, over 14 years. Mm. Um, after I graduated from White's Creek, I decided that majorating was really something that I was interested in. I loved it, loved to have kids, I loved to dance myself. So therefore, I decided to go back to my alumni and work with those uh, majorettes there. I started at White's Creek working with their majorettes. Um, not gonna tell you a year, then I might tell you my mm -hmm. age. But mm -hmm. again, it was a long time. I did that for 12 years at White's Creek. Then I've been at Pearl Cone for three years now. Um, it's just something that I love to do. I love to mentor. Um, young ladies and help them to develop into grown women. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ayers, why don't you tell us, some, give us some information in reference to the band itself. You, I think you, it's called a Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet School uh -huh. Band. Now, what does all of that mean together? All right, so the Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School Marching Band is the band of tradition. And um, if you know anything about Nashville, more specifically North Nashville, you know the history of it. Uh, the renowned Jefferson Street, um, the Pearl Cone Institute itself, uh, you know that Pearl Cone was Pearl and then there was a school cone and they, when integration happened, they became Pearl Cone. Um, the history behind that school in itself, it, it creates an atmosphere of pride. The Pearl Cone Marching Band is the number one band in Nashville and it has been so for years. And when I say years, I mean 30 plus years. Um, before myself, I've been at Pearl Cone for four years. Uh, Mr. John Severe was the band director before I uh, got there. He created a tradition of excellence. Um, the band has performed on national stages. The band has been televised. The band has won several awards and honors. And we strive today to keep that name going. Um, I am thankful for my kids. They are dedicated, they are passionate, and more importantly, their parents are also a, a great support for me as well. Now, Ms. Wilcox, as a twirler, I think you indicated that uh, you twirl a lot. Yes. Now, how do you uh, prepare your uh, charges? Uh, and I'm assuming that there might be some male twirlers as well as female. How do you prepare the, your charges for doing what you are now professionally doing? Well, we, we did have a male um, da, a majorette before. We have had male majorettes before. Um, we encourage both. If you can dance, you can dance, male or female. We don't discriminate. Um, but my charge is if, um, if you have that passion and you can dance, then, you know, we welcome you. Okay, so what we're going to do, Ms. Wilcox, we're going to take our first commercial break, and we're going to come back and start with you. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
very good. Okay. Well, let's get the joy. Okay, okay, now we just yeah. get the nice picture. Even though I watch okay. how Venom beat my tongue. Oh, what to say, Lord? Pearl Cone Entertainment <laughs> Magnet yeah. High School yeah. Band. Martin Band. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School Marching Band. And of course we have with us to talk about this extraordinary band, the band director himself, Mr. Bruce Ayers, and with Mr. Bruce Ayers is Ms. Tangela Wilcox. And Mr. Ayers and Ms. Wilcox, let me welcome the two of you to of the show this morning and tell you how delighted we are to have you. Now, let's start off, Mr. Ayers, by giving us some information in reference to your background, your education, and some of the things that were important in terms of leading you to us this morning. And Ms. Mil Wilcox will give us some additional information in reference to her background, education, and experiences. And we're going to try to get out of this segment in six minutes. So you've got about three minutes, and Ms. Wilcox, you'll have about two minutes to talk about yourself during that time. Let's start with right. you, Mr. Ayers. Well, thank you for having us. Um, Yes, a little background by myself. As you know, my name is Bruce Ayers. I am from Dover, Delaware. And I think that's where a lot of my musical background started. Uh, my family has an, an emerged um, experience with music. Uh, I began music at the age of four years old. And I think at that age, my parents really started to invest in that. Uh, I went to Dover High School in Dover, Delaware, where I became a drum major there. And then after that, I attended Virginia State University, where I was the first sophomore drum major um, in the history of the university. Um, I think there is where, I, again, a lot of my musical experiences and my background started to develop. Um, after graduating from Virginia State University in 2012, I attended Tennessee State University, aristocratic bands, um, where I, be, uh, I get my master's degree in music. Um, Tennessee State University has had a tremendous impact on my life as well. Very good. Ms. Wilcox? Yes, hi again. Um, my name is Tangela Wilcox. Um, as you stated, I started baton twirling at the age of four. Um, it was something that I loved, loved to dance, loved to twirl, so my mom felt that she needed to get me into something. So baton twirling was the foundation that was laid. Um, after the time twirling, I decided when I went to high school, I'm an alumni of Weiss Creek High School, and I was a majorette there. So after I graduated, I decided to go back uh, and give back. Um, I love mentoring young ladies and helping them develop into grown women. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to become, well, I was asked to become the majorette coach at Weiss Creek and was there for over 12 years. I've been at Pearl Cone for three years as the majorette coach. And it's just something that I love and I have a passion for. You know, Mr. Ayers, I think that uh, most people know of the uh, Pearl Cone uh, Mac Entertainment Band, a marching band, but uh, what are some of the things that you would like for those people who might not know anything about this band? What would you like to say in reference to that uh, during the last uh, minute and a half that we have here on okay. this segment? Uh, yes, the Pearl Cone uh, Entertainment Magna High School Marching Band, our name is the Band of Tradition. And w a lot of times when we think of tradition, we think of things not changing. But um, I think that that name, it, it alludes to something else. It's a band of tradition because of the tradition of excellence that we hold. 
Um, anyone who knows the Pearl Cone Band knows that you're, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get an award-winning performance every time you see the Mer Pearl Cone Marching Band. Very good. And as a matter of fact, that's why we wanted to uh, deal with this particular band this morning, because we know of the tradition and we've seen you march and et cetera. And so we know it's a very, very popular band and we know that this will be a popular show. Let's make some statements in reference to this band uh, over the last uh, minute and a half that we have, Ms. Wilcox. This band uh, is a very positive and a very growing band. Uh, we, we have kids that are, uh, like I said, magnet schools, and we also have kids that are feeder that attend the band also. If you are, uh, if you are zoned to Pearl Cone, you are more than welcome to come and be a participant of the band also. Mm -hmm. And so you do a lot of reaching out uh, in a real sense, uh, trying to bring in as many people as you possibly can to this particular band. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take our first commercial break, uh, which will be a uh, two-minute uh, in a commercial break mm -hmm. and then we're going to come by and back and we're going to have you to give us some information over the last next eight minutes dealing with the band some of the things some of your successes some of your aspirations and some of the things that you'd like to highlight to let people know what you're doing because i know quite well what you're doing i've known about this band for the last 20 years <laughs> you see and so uh when we come back during this second commercial break uh, well, the, this first commercial break, we will have you to uh, give us that kind of information. And then Ms. Wilcox will give you an opportunity during that next eight minutes to uh, talk about some of the real things that you are, con you are concerned with. It. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Bruce Ayers and uh, Miss Tangela Wilcox in reference to Pearl High School Entertainment, Pearl Cone High School Entertainment Marching Band. And I know, Miss uh, Wilcox, I didn't get all of that straight, <laughs> but, but I think we've said it earlier in, in an earlier show in reference to what you are doing here and et cetera. Talk about uh, some of the things in reference to what some of the young people do under your tutor's guidance in a real sense, and then uh, Mr. Ayers will uh, be able to close us out for this second segment. Yes, sir. Okay, we are Pearl Cone Majorettes. Um, this year I have 19 young ladies. Um, this is the largest that uh, I've had since I've been at Pearl Cone. Um, it's, it's very interesting because you know you have several different personalities that you're dealing with. So these young ladies, we not only focus on their dance, and uh, but the main focus is their education. We want to make sure that their education is being met, that their grades are at where they need to be uh, before they are able to perform. A lot of times, some of the girls may have to sit out uh, due to their grades not being where they need to be. Because like I said, our main focus is their education, and dance is second. But um, my ladies, you know, the main thing that I try to focus on is I know, uh, especially my seniors, um, we are preparing them to become college majorettes. So therefore, we want to focus on 
the the way that they carry themselves, uh, the way that they um, do interviews. Uh, we want to focus on the way, just the way that they overall look. It's not just about dance. We want to uh, go out and work within the community, uh, teach them how to work, teach them how to fill out a resume, you know, and just build them, uh, build their confidence level. Just help them to mature and become young ladies. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's not only just about majorette, it's about their whole positive build as a woman. I would imagine you could say the same thing in reference to the band itself on the stairs. Speak to that. Yes, sir. Um, like uh, Tangela said, we focus on education. You are a student musician, an emphasis on student before musician or dancer. Um, last year, I'm proud to say that we had 100% of our graduating class attend college, and they all are doing very well in their first uh, semester. Um, Grades are very important. Education is very important. It doesn't matter how talented you are. Without that education, there's going to be a lot of life blocks that can hinder you from being successful. Um, I check grades. Behavior is also important. Your reputation, not only do you represent yourself, your parents, but you represent this band program that a lot of people have worked to build up to a, a, where it is now. So we need for you to behave appropriately. Um, and we need for your grades to be exceeding the expectation. Um, a lot of our students, like I said, they are in college now, and we look forward to our students currently, our seniors, to also follow in their footsteps. Um, I don't believe that when you have a high standard for you to backtrack. So if we had a 100% graduation rate last year, I expect for a 100% graduation rate this year. Now, that's well. unusual, isn't it, to uh, graduate all of the students in your band? I mean, all of the band members who are mm -hmm. ready, it's time for them to graduate, and all of them graduated last year. Yes, sir. Uh, it is maybe not unusual, but it is very rare uh, for 100% of your students to graduate, oh, yes. um, especially mm -hmm. being from the North Nashville community. There's mm -hmm. a lot of trauma. There's a lot of situations that could come up mm -hmm. that may hinder a child from being able to reach that level of success. Mm -hmm. But... I think because Tangela, she keeps me accountable as well, we have created a program where that is now the culture is to be successful in your education. Speak to that, Ms. Uh, Wilcox. Yes, um, we, we have communication with um, our students, teachers. Um, they, we go, we meet the teachers. We, um, like we, have, we have some students that don't attend Paracon that attend other magnet schools, but they are zoned to Paracon, which is okay for them to, we allow them to participate in the band. So therefore we have the email, um, we use email or even sometimes, you know, we just go in, if we have some time off, we'll go in and, you know, meet their teachers and just have a relationship with the teachers um, just to make sure that we are keeping those students on the right track. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes, you know, they may fall a little bit behind or, but, you know, but we have tutors that come in um, that can help with the students that are having difficult with different um, subjects. And we just want to make sure that our kids, you know, not only be great band members, but be a great student, period. You know, uh, Mr. Ayers, you talk about uh, the band. But uh, the band cannot be there by itself. I think that uh, there's a whole athletic program that uh, the band is associated with. How is Pearl Cone doing this year in terms of the athletics, uh, especially football and et cetera? Oh, um, Pearl Cone has always had a reputation of having a wonderful football program. Um, currently, right now, we are on the road to the state championship. Our last regular season game is next week, and so we will beat Wise Creek next week. <laughs> um, and so we will go to the state of playoffs. Mm -hmm. And so um, not only are, is the band a part of the athletic department, because band is a sport, it's a non-contact sport, but it, the things mm -hmm. that uh, you know, qualify a band member to be physically fit, it, it's considered a sport. And so um, the Pearl Cone Way, which is an athletic department's um, phrase, is that students put school first. And so the football team, along with the basketball team, volleyball team, um, soccer, we all held our students accountable to the mm -hmm. same standards. 
Mm -hmm. And you found uh, Pearl Cone to be an excellent place for you to uh, demonstrate some, not only your talents, but also to encourage young people, especially young women, Absolutely. to uh, be, be the, the best that they can be. Is that what you were saying, Ms. Wilcox? That is correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Um, like I said, I, um, after White's Creek, I thought I was retiring, mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, I had that passion and I love it so much, I wasn't ready to, so therefore, mm -hmm. I came to Pearl and I did Well, now, how long years. did you work at uh, Pearl, I mean, uh, White's Creek? I was at White's Creek for over 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I um, kind of rest for a couple of years and mm -hmm. then I came And so to you've Pearl. been active in, in, in this kind, you've been doing this kind of activity yes, with sir. bands, twirling, and whatever, <laughs> practically all of your life. Is that what you said? Majority of me. As a matter of fact, I think you started uh, your band career in a real sense at four years old, yes, dealing sir. with music. And, 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 mm -hmm. and so the two of you would advise those individuals who might aspire toward uh, becoming involved in music, athletics, and et cetera, to think in terms of the band. And so you're also telling me the band is more than just a band. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we are a family. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time together. Um, I commend the students because not only do we practice after school, most nights we don't get out of practice until 7 p.m. Very good. And of course, let's take this final commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Mr. Ayers and Ms. Wilcox uh, from Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School Marching Band. And they're giving us some information that will wrap up, uh, Mr. Ayers, in terms of uh, some of your experiences with the band and some of the, uh, your plans and some of the things that you're planning on doing and et cetera. And, and Ms. Wilcox will wrap us up during the last eight minutes. Okay. Yes, um, so we mentioned earlier about the band's expectations as far as the education is concerned. But band is also very fun. It's an outlet for the kids. Um, we've created a family within the band program. We spend maybe 80% of the students' time is spent with the band program. Um, so the parents, they look to us as, you know, another part of their life. Um, and I'm thankful for my parents. We have an, an amazing boosters association which is for parents, they provide meals for the band, they help with transportation, they provide materials for the band, and the, apparently the band program cannot work without them. So I want to thank our band booster parents for being so selfless in what they do. Um, also, 
just last year we had an, an, a phenomenal performance at the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center, which is a big deal. Anyone from Nashville knows the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center is the premier um, center for the Nashville Symphony. We partnered with the Frisk Museum, and we brought in Nick Cave, who's an African-American um, visual artist, mm -hmm. and he performed with us his one of his pieces, um, Nick Cave, which was featuring Nashville, mm -hmm. and it pretty much brought the Nashville community together, and it, uh, it provided a national stage for the Pearl Cone Marching Band to perform on. Um, that was an, a major accomplishment for not only myself, but for the band, because this performance also won nomination for a national Emmy. Um, we are still currently on the road to receiving the Emmy, but we've been nominated for an Emmy, and I think that's a lot to say about this, what the students are doing at Pearl Cone as far as the band performance a program is concerned. Um, also, the name Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School, um, the Entertainment Magnet School, we are the only school in the country with the name Entertainment Magnet. We are a Grammy Award winning school, we are an Emmy Award winning school. So our students have opportunities that no other student in this country has as far as the music industry is concerned. Very good. Ms. Wilcox. Yes, as he stated, you know, these students, they have a great opportunity. This is something that can go on their resume um, for jobs or for school. You know, and it looks really good. And it's just good, it's a good, um, all in our um, showcase for them. Mm -hmm. And it gives all of you uh, something to work with in terms of the band itself and uh, individuals outside of the band and et cetera. Uh, the band has not only uh, a real tradition, but the band is, is, is perhaps one of the most important drivers in terms of bringing people out around to uh, Pearl Cone. And that, certainly the athletic program is mm -hmm. important, but the band is, is a central part of that program, is it not? It is very an essential part of the program. Um, our community is amazing. They support us 100%. Mm -hmm. We practice in the neighborhood. Our school is surrounded by um, homes. And so when, every time we practice, we can expect for our community to come out and support us and cheer us on to get us across that final stretch. Also, I would like to um, give acknowledgement to the administration. Mrs. Mary M. Harrington is our executive principal and she is a number one supporter of the band. Mm -hmm. I believe because of her background in music as well, but we cannot function without our principal. Um, she supports us 100%. So Ms. Harrington is the principal there at Pearl, uh, and, and she plays an important part in terms of helping to bring the band activities together. Is that what we're saying? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, from anything from encouraging our students to do well in their classes, mm -hmm. encouraging our students to do well in the band, mm -hmm. and also she, she believes that the band should be the face of the school, and so she supports us in any endeavor that we have, mm -hmm. um, all the way to funding and mm -hmm. provide, make sure the band has everything that it needs mm -hmm. to succeed. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Wilcox, uh, 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 the last, over the last few minutes, let's talk about uh, some of your young ladies as well as the men who might be a, a part of that uh, twirling activity. How does that work with the band? How do well, you make that a part of the band? Actually, this year we don't really actually have any baton twirlers. Mm -hmm. We have dancers. We have a few ladies that have uh, twirled in the past, but we just haven't really incorporated the baton twirling yet. Mm -hmm. um, but they practice. They practice 24-7. They practice so much that even the ladies even video each other when they go home mm -hmm. um, for the ladies who maybe didn't make practice or, you know, just couldn't be there at the time due to another appointment. They video their practices and send it to each each other so they're very dedicated to what they're doing um, that's something that we push and strive for them to be dedicated as, um, as well mm -hmm. so you know, they practice really hard so they can put on a great show for everyone mm -hmm. now uh, Mr. Ayers uh, <laughs> looking at uh, some of the things that the band might stand <coughs> excuse me might stand in need of you know I know that you've got support from the community and et cetera. But what are some of the financial needs, uh, instruments and those kind of things? Because I know I've had an opportunity to see other bands uh, around uh, Nashville and, 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 and somehow your instruments don't seem to match out in terms of being uh, the quality new mm -hmm. in a real sense. When are you able to uh, receive new instruments and et cetera. Do you have any need for new instruments or whatever? Yes, sir. Um, 
What I would like to mention is that we are blessed to have um, support from the CMA, Country Music Association Foundation, and they are partnership with Metro uh, Public Schools, and they provide instruments for our students. Um, the needs that we do have are, I would love to take this band beyond where we've been. We've been a lot of places, but we tend to stay in the southern borders. Um, before school started, we traveled to Kentucky, We've gone to Miss, um, Memphis. We've gone to other surrounding cities. But I'd love to get the band to travel the country. Um, in my band program growing up, we traveled the world. So it takes a lot of funding just for us to travel to an away football game can range from 800 to $1,200. So it does take a lot of funds to um, move the band, to feed the band, and support the band. So my dream and my vision is to see the band travel more. Um, there's no amount of funds that would fulfill that need because we there's so much that we want to do and there's so much that these kids deserve. But um, we are thankful for what we do have. And of course, we can always use more. And use more. Yeah. And Ms. Wilcox, you would probably say the same I thing. I would agree 100% because a lot of times these students, this is the only exposure that they may have or they may get. So therefore, you know, we want to make it memorable. We want to make sure that if we can help in any way that they get the exposure that they're desiring. And so the band season is not over yet yeah. that you've got a, another uh, activity that you want to be involved in dealing with uh, the, the athletic program or whatever. How, how does that work out? Yes, sir. So the band season is nowhere near over. In fact, the band season is never over. These mm -hmm. students, they dedicate their summers. We get out of school at the end of May. Mm -hmm. We begin band camp the beginning of July. So a, mm -hmm. a traditional student would have an entire summer at the end of May through August. Mm -hmm. Band students, they start in July. Um, and even during winter break, they're asked to come back early. During fall break, they're asked to perform. They're asked to practice. During spring break, they're asked to perform and practice as well. So the band students, they never really have a break. The band season never ends. So if there was some way that we could acknowledge what these students do, I would, I would like to see that do a scholarship, a scholarship mm -hmm. awarded to the band seniors, you know, to also give initiative for them continuing their education post high school. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, I think that that would certainly be possible in terms of creating a band scholar. You don't have a band scholarship to uh, give to students who might want to go beyond Pearl Cone? So we do encourage our students to apply for college and audition for scholarship, but sometimes that scholarship that the university offers is not enough. Mm -hmm. And so we would like to be able to uh, provide funds for our senior graduating seniors to you know pay for books even if it's as little as a five hundred dollar scholarship mm -hmm. for each student mm -hmm. that would be the ultimate goal very good mm -hmm. let me uh, thank the two of you during the last half minute we have here for coming by and giving us that excellent information and I'm sure that uh, most of our audience know about the Pearl mm -hmm. Cone uh, entertainment magnet school marching band <laughs> But of course, this will only reinforce what they do know. And we uh, encourage you to uh, tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning. At the stadium. At the stadium. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's at the stadium. It's All been right. at the stadium for the last couple of You know it's going to be an early game. So it'll be 4 o'clock. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's an early game. So oh. make sure you, you know, get out.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the impact of technology on education and learning. And we're fortunate enough to have with us to talk about the impact of technology on education and learning, Dr. E.K. Sanford from Tennessee State University. And of course, Dr. Sanford, let me welcome you to the show this morning and to tell you again how delighted we are to have you here because you bring such excellent information, especially when you deal with education and technology and et cetera. And so let's uh, start off by having you to give us some information about your background, education, and some of your experiences, and then we'll get into the topic, the impact of technology on education and learning. I and think that's the title. That's, that's, that's the title. title. You okay. always get it right. And thank you again so much for allowing me to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm always delighted mm -hmm. to share information and, and to have this as a platform to doing it. Mm -hmm. As you may very well know, and to the listening audience, I'm Dr. E. Kelly Sanford, mm -hmm. professor of sociology at Tennessee State University. I've been there now over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I did a postdoc, which I would like to start off with today, at the Pennsylvania State University and State College, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where I looked at the gerontology. Mm -hmm. And um, prior to that, at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I worked at a number of different places with the national headquarters of the American Red Cross mm -hmm. on HIV AIDS education, which even here I've worked um, at, the, at the Meharry Medical Center on HIV AIDS with the late Dr. Jacqueline Fleming. And so I wanted to kind of stress that. As, and then at the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives leading, which is going to be very much um, related to what I'm talking about today indirectly. Um, then I'm originally from North Carolina, North Carolina Central University, um, and from Oxford, North Carolina. And so I'm delighted again to be here today. Very good. You know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sanford, uh, when we talk about uh, the impact of technology on learning and education, that's a very, very important topic. Yeah. And, and having had an opportunity to uh, use technology in learning and education, I found that uh, I was able to make more progress yes. in terms of uh, various devices and et cetera, and et cetera, and to apply much of the things that I was able to learn yes. through education and uh, technology. So yes. let's, let's talk about it from your perspective okay. and give us some information in reference to that. Okay, and thank you again very much. And what I would like to do is try to frame it mm -hmm. with just by saying that technology, more than any time in the history of the world, has done exactly what you have just said. Mm -hmm. It has made us more connected. It has indeed allowed us to be able to, through different venues of using technology, stay in touch with people, people from different countries. We can text, we can email, and it's just a rapid change of social interaction through technology. But I would like to frame it by saying that we have moved in our society from an industrial society into a technological one and now into a telecommunications society. And there are a vast amount of positive aspects of technology. Of course, you're in the communication world, so look at how we are able to do things today because of technology. Um, we have the technology to be able to look way out in the ocean and then predict that a hurricane is going to come at a certain level. We have technology to be able to have um, satellites in outer space so we can horn in on different countries and know precisely what's going on. Um, we can have people to do an assessment of your home and your roof and they can use technology there in their office in Hendersonville or m many miles away and they can tell you how your roof is and give you assessment mm -hmm. from technology or look up where you're living. Mm -hmm. So it has all of those wonderful aspects of it and as you and I are professors, we lived at a time period where we had a blackboard mm -hmm. and now we have what they call a smart board. Mm -hmm. We were able to use chalk at one time, now we use a pencil on the board that we write on and it just magically comes and we can change the colors and do a lot of things mm -hmm. with it. We can pull up information as you've had me to bring up some of your shows here mm -hmm. right in my classroom mm -hmm. but I'm here today to talk about an essential problem mm -hmm. with the advancement of technology and how it has indeed moved so fast that the actual founders of technology had in mind for citizens to become so dependent mm -hmm. so addicted to technology that they would have to have it mm 
Mm -hmm. And it's become a multi, multi-billion dollar industry because of technology on the addiction and on the inherent needs mm -hmm. of us to have to have it and have this need for it. Mm -hmm. So while there are all these positive aspects of it that connects us, there could be a false sense of reality to that connection mm -hmm. that it prevents us from actually at this point in time mm -hmm. socially interacting on an individual level. So I would like to pick up with that aspect of it. Very good, and i tell you what we'll do. We'll take our first commercial break, and then we'll come back and we'll have eight minutes for you to uh, talk about that aspect of it. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. E.K. Sanford from Tennessee State University, and he's given us some information dealing with the impact of technology on education and learning. And of course, Dr., let's pick up where we left off and allow you over the next eight minutes to inform us in reference to this topic. And thank you again. And I left off by saying that how we have become so addicted and dependent upon technology mm -hmm. with all of its positive aspects, mm -hmm. that addictions was actually thought about in the beginning stages before it was ever invented. Mm -hmm. And felt that if we as humans became addicted to it, then we would have to economically pay for it. We would have to use our brains for the technology aspect of it and have a, such a need that we would want it more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Now we are finding that it is having some type of a impact in a negative way mm -hmm. on our cognitive, that means thinking ability, okay. Okay. because we become so used to the technology doing it for us. Mm -hmm. And so now when we think in terms of education and thinking, some of the values of education that you and I had in elementary school, <coughs> to junior high school, to high school, they are the same, same collective idea of what we have to learn in our brains mm -hmm. as we did at our time as we have mm -hmm. to learn right now. Mm -hmm. But now students are so addicted to it that it's actually harmed the brain from mm -hmm. actually being able to mm -hmm. retain information, mm -hmm. to learn it, to understand the value of it because they feel that they are so addicted to the cell phones or to technology or mm -hmm. Instagram or Facebooking mm -hmm. that that's their means of getting information, that's their means of trying to communicate with other people. So mm -hmm. when it's time to bring their thoughts together and cognitively share it through social interaction mm -hmm. individually, then they become very narrow in that <sighs> ability to mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of scholars out there now in the, in the literature are finding, even in Silicon Valley, where they were coming up with the most highly advanced technological types of advances there mm -hmm. to then sell to the public in multi-billion dollars um, gains, mm -hmm are now seeing the negative impact. And they are feeling that it's moved to a mental disorder oh, that we really don't feel that is mental disorder mm -hmm. because we have so much immediate gratification and a good feeling mm -hmm. in within ourselves to think that, oh, that's a good feeling. Let me do more and more of it. Mm -hmm. Let me continue to do it to the point that people are becoming so lonely. We call that in sociology as far as Durkheim's theory on suicide, mm -hmm. anomi or anomatic, that we are so endeavored to be into the technology, mm -hmm. staying up long hours, staying involved in it, that we become lonely 
And as a result of that, we will find suicide rates have been increased because of technological advances. Mm -hmm. Not only are suicide rates becoming more so because of that lonely feeling, and there are websites where other people are feeling that same way, mm -hmm. and then comments are being made, and then they become connected to those negative, lonely feelings that they are then willing to commit suicide. But also, people are being bullied mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. to the point where they are feeling in their minds that this is something that is real, that they are willing to commit mm -hmm. suicide. So it's actually having a mental um, type of an impact on people because of our positive use of mm -hmm. it. So while many can see the gains of it, and it's unquestionable with yeah. technology advanced that we are mm -hmm. able to do things like we've never done before, uh, we're able to have all of these, from taking pictures to sending them to, to texting to all of those types of items are so positive, mm -hmm. but they are, we are finding now that it's negative impacting us cognitively. Mm -hmm. And when we look at PIJ and look at the sensory motor stages, mm -hmm. that's just the five senses for the listening viewers. Okay. How is technology now impacting a little child who needs to develop their hearing, their, their, their seeing, they're mm -hmm. touching mm -hmm. because they now are sitting in a scroller with computers in front of them and that action of going back and forth is stimulating the brain mm -hmm. that they want more and more of it. So when they cry, they're given the computer to stimulate the brain to have more and more okay. movement. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the movement can go left or right, there's no, or left or right, right to left, up and down, doesn't make any difference. They are just, their brains are just being stimulated cognitively mm -hmm. while they are missing out on the human interaction of using those same senses that they need to develop as they move from zero to two years old, from two to seven, then then into the first grade and by the third grade exam, they have become so addicted and cognitively mental mm -hmm. that they can, cannot understand how to do their homework, how to retain information to do well on exams or to read and retain information or to understand how to share it back because they have not comprehended it well enough. So, so, so this is what you mean when you say the impact of technology on education and learning. Yes. That this is a really a kind of a negative while technology allows for a large number of opportunities, yes. it also has a, a, a whole train of negative kinds of things that uh, unless we are careful that we can get caught up in. Is that what we're saying? That's exactly what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And as you may remember, when the technology was coming out in such a large numbers, we were saying it's a positive thing to have all children to have an iPad mm -hmm. or have a laptop. And, and, and this has impacted them, it was supposed to be positive, but the impact is now we are finding it being negative. Even if you Google, so here we are saying that Google, Google technology, uh, uh -huh. Silicon Valley, you are finding the people who are actually creating new apps and new mm -hmm. technology with, with computers and, and, and through technology are, are removing their children from tech schools mm -hmm. that were looked at positive and putting them into other learning environments like mm -hmm. the Waldorf school mm -hmm. where they are dealing with the senses and dealing with understanding numbers and mm -hmm. dealing with cognitive development of touching, smelling, and feeling, mm -hmm. and speaking, and all of those things. They are doing that, and they, and they are the ones that have all the money and the power to have their children to the best tech schools, but they know cognitively they are missing out on things. So now we mm -hmm. have to ask ourselves, with um, lower income families, Good. how is that impacting them cognitively, mm -hmm. not to do well on standardized tests, or to learn to read and write and do arithmetic, mm -hmm. because we still live in a society that calls for those skill sets, mm -hmm. and we are becoming lower in that if we are not aware of the impact of technology on learning and cognitive oh, development. Okay, doctor, what we'll do, we'll uh, get ready for this first commercial break, but I think that this is the information that we were looking for, because I think uh, many people understand the importance of technology, but they don't see them, and I don't think that many of us understand the impact that it is having upon mm -hmm. our everyday lives. And so what we'll do, we'll take our first commercial break, and we'll come back and we'll have eight minutes to further develop this idea as well as any others that you'd like to talk about. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Okay, this
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. The topic today is the impact of technology on <clears throat> learning and education. And Dr. E.K. Sanford from Tennessee State University has given us a review over some of the important problems dealing with uh, education, technology, and learning. Let's continue, yes. Doc. Okay, well, thank you again very much. And we were on this whole segment of the impact mm -hmm. of technology on our cognitive and that's thinking or, or the brain. Mm -hmm. Let's just move it right there mm -hmm. and how we might think that some of the things that we are seeing and the occurrences mm -hmm. of, our, of people's behaviors and conduct mm -hmm. is positive, but we are understanding from social science research now mm -hmm. that there is causing a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. But we have become so accustomed to the new way mm -hmm. of people's behaviors that we are not seeing it as a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. But we are finding lower scores, lower attention spans, mm -hmm. and it's a shift mm -hmm. in being in people having a cognitive ability to be able to do certain things as they should and be required to do. And so let, Instead of most of us applauding technology and how great it is and et cetera, what we're saying here now is that it has some drawbacks, some yeah. negative impacts and whatever. Yeah. Is that what we're talking yeah, we are, about? We are very much talking. Mm -hmm. And we know one of the aims of it was to make life better. Mm -hmm. We live in an American culture where we like efficiency, mm -hmm. we like fast pace, we like everything. And so technology fits into a capitalistic type of culture mm -hmm. that we are benefiting from by living in America. Mm -hmm. And it seems positive but it is impacting us mentally at this point and we are not understanding that mental mm -hmm. incapacity that is causing our brain mm -hmm. to the point that we can almost go to the point of saying it's a mental disorder for us to be so addicted to it that we cannot control it. Now, so, is this a great sociological point of view now that most yeah. sociologists agree upon? I, I would think most psychologists, social Soci psychologists, uh -huh. so, and, and then neuro. I want you. Uh -huh. to, I want to even bring it into the science. Neuropsychologists are, and, and neuroscientists that understand the brain mm -hmm. are understanding the impact that it is actually having on our cognitive abilities. And let me just break down real quick cognitive ability. We've done it on the, on the show before, mm -hmm. but PIJ is one of the leading social psychologists that talks about the four different cognitive thinking stages mm -hmm. of human development. So as I state them, I want us to see how technology presently mm -hmm. is impacting that in a negative way. The first one is called the sensory motor stage. Okay. That means mm -hmm. the five senses. And if you can think about a person that's aware of the senses and that you expose a child from zero to two mm -hmm. and from two to seven of all the senses in a very positive way mm -hmm. through social interaction. Mm -hmm. And that helps them to develop their cognitive ability according to PIJ. Presently with technology, we're putting the iPhone or, or a, a laptop or an iPad in front of them with certain images that are moving back and forth with no meaning. Mm -hmm. And that is impacting their cognitive uh -huh. abilities as well. Mm -hmm. So they are seeing it, they are motioning with it, they are having an interest in it, but they are missing out on it, the sound of a bird or the mm -hmm. sound of other things that's around them uh -huh. in reality, or mom and dad being there talking with them mm -hmm. and hearing that interaction. So that's why it has become so negative. Now, if you're just out in the real world and notice how many instances families got their children in scrollers mm -hmm. and they have an iPad on the scroller okay. and that's entertaining them while they are shopping. Mm -hmm. But so they are missing out on seeing the different colors of cans, hearing the sounds of things that are being put in the baskets, hearing the, the cash register say ding, 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 mm -hmm. and all of those things that we are supposed to be exposed to to help with our cognitive development. That's the first stage. The second stage is called the pre-operational stage where we can add, multiply, subtract, and divide. So by being around just with two apples and one is going and doing with these things as far as being able to see images and understand a red apple, a yellow apple, those types of images. Or the Dr. Seuss books where you are reading and, and learning the cat in the hat and rhymes and rhythms. You can learn in this pre-operational stage. Now in the next one called the concrete operational stage is where we are at a stage of seven to 12 years old and there you can add, multiply, subtract, and divide. Now of course I know listeners saying, well you can use technology to do that and you can, but we're talking about 
the overemphasis of just being addicted to it where you are doing other things beyond learning your timetables mm -hmm. or how to multiply, subtract, and divide or to do those types of things and that's cognitively impacting us negatively. Mm -hmm. Now, you can stay and this is where use of a computer can make you stay from 7 to 11 to the rest of your life when you're addicted to mm -hmm. technology. You become so addicted to it that you can't move into the next level that's called the formal operational stage and that's from 12 mm -hmm. years old where you can think abstractly where you can understand a theory and then apply that to something you know about the consequences of cause and effect you understand that if I defer my gratification in learning in mm -hmm. school I can do well on an SAT then I can get into college I can learn skills there and then I can get a good job mm -hmm. that's what you're supposed to be at at 12 years old for the rest of your life but if you're stuck at the concrete operational stage in computers, that will satisfy the cognitive thinking that you are satisfied with that mm -hmm. and you won't develop to be able to read a book and to retain what's in that book or to have the interest in understanding or discussing it with someone else or writing an essay. Mm -hmm. That's at the formal cognitive developmental stage. So while we are not going through that formal stage and that helps you to go to college and to read and to do well, mm -hmm. We are not there. It has already pulled us away. Mm -hmm. And the upcoming kids that are just being born or first, second, third grade or, or the newborns, the first year, second, third year, mm -hmm. they are becoming so addicted to it that they are wanting it and will cry to have it. And now it's moving us into the point of being so addicted to it that people are being becoming lonely, this anomatic okay. type mm -hmm. of state. And they are feeling mm -hmm. that they are meeting others through cyberspace and through the computer of others that are feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, there's a shift in communication. So when you say, mm -hmm. oh, are you communicating? Yes, but with people uh, on the internet that's right. or uh, within cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And they are not having the human contact or touching and feeling and verbal communication, very similar to what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. That's being lost. And some people, we have seen the statistics go up in suicide rates because people are being convinced that they are in touch while they are really lonely and they are meeting others that are speaking through computers in the same way and then they are committing suicide. While the mothers and fathers and friends will not even recognize that shift in behavior because mm -hmm. they are one way and they have an online type of place where they go to speak about this other aspect of their personality mm -hmm. that is feeling lonely and, and, and is not recognizable by families and peers and friends. And, and when so something, suicide rates something are going bad up. happens in reference to that, yes. the family didn't know, didn't nobody know. Didn't had any idea, and et cetera. Is that Absolutely. what we're saying? Absolutely. That's uh -huh. exactly. Uh -huh. well, and they're becoming so addicted to it, they're staying up late at night, mm -hmm. losing rest. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've got about a minute and a half. Okay. Uh, what so, would you suggest that we do in terms of breaking that cycle. Well, great. This has been a great program to really first and foremost to understand that it is indeed a problem. You mm -hmm. have to understand there's a reoccurring problem. pattern. Mm -hmm. problem. The second now, you have to regulate it. You have to use it in a positive way, give some time for fun, but then it has to be regulated as far as how much time is, is used on the cell phones. Mm -hmm. If universities could have an app to allow uh, a, a break with it for an hour and off of it, if they don't use it in a smart way, you can't, the students would be much better off mm -hmm. by reading the newspaper or listening to news on it and mm -hmm. using it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So families must regulate it. We must understand it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully at, in religious institutions will understand the problem too so we can change some behaviors and understand the shift and how it's mentally negatively impacting our learning and cognitive ability. And so technology is fine. And we all ought to ascribe for technology, but it can have some serious drawbacks. Is Absolutely. That, is, is that the final statement that we it want to is. try to and make? And it has to have a great balance. Mm -hmm. Very good. And of course, let me uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanford, for giving us that excellent information and allowing us to see things from a different perspective. And you don't have to be young in order to have that to happen to you because I can see some of the, some of the th ideas myself yes. in what you're talking about. Yeah, but anyway, please. thank you. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and 